I'm reading the scriptures today, so I'll read them whenever I want. <laughs> and it's not going to be right now. All right. Well, every now and again, a preacher delivers a message and then has to deliver it again. It happens to me every week. He's fine. But sometimes when you deliver the message the first time, you know, you, you notice a little bit of a feel and you think of some things you might be able to tweak and maybe do it even a little better the next time. So, I did a little rewrite between services. And literally, God only knows how this is going to work out. <laughs> so, we are continuing our Renewal and Revival series and we're in this portion of the series where we're looking at this research done by the Barna Group about how people outside the church perceive Christianity and Christians. And what that means for us in terms of ministry and what that means for us individually whenever I come across this information, how do I process it and how do I use it to uh, improve my relationship with God and live more faithfully in the light of Christ. So, today, we are going to look at the perception that the church is anti-science, anti-intellect, all right? Now, how many of you find the conversation between science and faith to be a bit troublesome at times? Okay? What we're going to do this morning is we're going to take an honest look at this conversation, okay? Now, front-loading with this. I'm not going to tell you what to believe. We all have our own conclusions that we're going to draw. What I am hoping that we will do is be able to see the conversation in a little bit of a different light and have permission to engage it more as conversation and less as combat. Because many times that seems to be what happens. There's headbutting that happens between the two. And I'm going to propose today that rather than being two opposites that are in conflict, they are actually wonderful friends if we see them rightly. So the question is, what does the world see that causes them to see us as anti-science or anti-intellect? And just for the, the record, when younger adults are approached, particularly ones that have left the church, about why they've left the church, this subject is easily in the top three, probably the top two, of why they have dismissed themselves from our, our number. So what they observe is that when Christians are presented with scientific fact that goes against our interpretation, we will dismiss the fact and cling to our interpretation. You understand what I mean, what I'm saying? Okay? So that we have evidence that something is true or, or, or real, if it doesn't jive with the way I interpret my Bible, I will hang on to my biblical interpretation over embracing the fact. In fact, I'll deny it vehemently. Um, what this does, in terms of younger Christians, is that Sometimes what happens is scientific-minded young people go off to school, like they do, and they start learning all kinds of really interesting things, right? And then they come back into the church, and then they come into a place where there's a, a very uh, hard, awkward amount of pressure. And that pressure many times comes in the form of saying, look, we, that's all well and good what you're learning there at school, but we don't agree with it because of the way we interpret our Bible. So you need to leave that stuff at the door, maybe dismiss it altogether, because it's leading you down the wrong path, maybe even putting your salvation in danger. And the way they see that is they have to choose between faith and fact. And in 2017, what are most of them choosing? Fact. They go science over faith. And we say, why is that? What can we do to stop that? And my hope is that we can make a little headway in that. What tends to happen then is we 
we see Christians paint, painting science and research as the enemy, demonizing it, saying that so the purpose of science is, is to disprove God and to yank the legs out from under our faith. Scientists would disagree with that. They would say, we really we don't have any... We don't have any dog in that fight. We're just asking questions and trying to find the answers and trying to understand the way the world works, the way the body works, the way the mind works. Um, and if that's giving you a bit of a crisis of faith, that's more your business than ours. Now, I told you I had to rewrite this thing. Here's what I want to encourage us to do, Okay want to encourage us to take a moment and realize that most of us, whether we realize it or not, have already taken steps to blend this conversation of faith and science in a very, very helpful way. And we want to capitalize on it a little bit more. So, TJ, can you pop this slide up here? Okay. Okay. Which one of these, the right or the left, is what the earth looks like? The one down in the right corner or the one up in the left corner? How many of you would say the one in the lower right corner? Okay. I would agree with you. All right. Why do we say that? Why do we agree with that? We have, yeah, we have pictures, right? Like we have these nifty things called rocket ships that go and go off the earth, far enough out there they can turn around with probably their cell phones at this point and um, whatever the satellites they have, and they snap a picture and they're like, "Hey, that's what it looks like," and that's awesome, right? I mean, that is amazing that we can we can do that and we can get that kind of insight into the vastness of God's creation, what it really looks like. The thing is, the top left one is the way the earth looks if we draw it according to the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about the four corners of the earth, right? That's not poetic. They literally were saying there's four corners of the earth because it's this flat surface. When they say heaven, they always say heaven is which way? Which way is the land of the dead? Down. The understanding was that, like, this language is very telling because what they're saying is that there's like these flat tiers or layers of creation, okay? And so this is where one is, this is where the next one is, this is where the next one is. How many of you are familiar with the term firmament in, in Genesis chapter 1? Well, you see that thing that looks kind of like a, a barrier over creation in that top left? That's the firmament. It's an actual physical barrier because in Genesis, it says God put a firmament to separate the waters above from the waters below, right? Right? Okay? So the understanding was there was like an ocean above the earth. And again, we're processing the language of the Old Testament because whenever there was a deluge of rain, what does it say happened? The what's of heaven were opened. The windows or floodgates. And whenever there was a drought, it was that they were closed. God shut up the heavens right? Well, we read that in a very interesting way because of our understanding of creation, but literally, and again, all I'm passing on to you is the literal understanding of what this looked like in the Old Testament, was that there were actual gates or windows in the firmament that God would peel back and allow the waters above to trickle into the waters below or into the land underneath. And whenever God was done having it rain, close them back up again. Does the fact that those pictures do not agree change 
the meaning of Genesis 1. Let me encourage you by taking us into 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is the go-to scripture for scripture validating its own authority. Many of you, I'm sure, know this scripture. It says that all scripture is breathed by God, God breathed, inspired by God, and is useful for instruction, correction, and training in righteousness. That matters. Okay? Because what it's saying is it's giving us the purpose and the intent of Scripture. The purpose and the intent of Scripture is to point us to God and help us live in right standing before God and with one another. Is that a fair statement? That's the, that's the point of Scripture, right? So Genesis 1, really, it doesn't matter which one of those two things it looked like, because that's not the point. The point of Genesis 1 is to say, look at the wonder and the goodness and the awesomeness of creation and worship the one that created it. Know the one that created it. Which is why following it with Genesis 2 is so important. Because Genesis 2 is where God is walking and talking with Adam and Eve, right? So Genesis 1 says, worship the one that created it and now realize the one that created it wants to walk and talk with you. Is that fair? Okay. See, we just did Genesis 1 and 2 in like three minutes. And again, my question is, does that spiritual message of righteousness before God matter which one of those pictures we had buy, buy into? No, because the spiritual truth is a spiritual truth, and it makes no difference about all the other stuff. Our scripture helps point us to God. And I point that out not to say, you know, well, doubt Genesis 1 if you believe in that one, or to say, if you do believe Genesis 1, ignore that one and start believing in that one. My point is to say this. Many times we get into wrong conversations when we start talking about science and start talking about faith together. Because we want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people who have spent their entire life researching a single area of the creation about their research. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't have time to read all the work that those folks do. So I, I don't understand it. So I don't need to argue with them about it. However, I do know that as people of faith, it is our job and the call of Jesus Christ for us to live in a way that says to the people that are making all of these discoveries with the knowledge and the understanding that you now have, how does God want us to use it to bless the world? So again, Christians are going to believe what they believe. My point is, what are the conversations we should be having versus what is the conflict that we are unnecessarily indulging in? Let's go to Ecclesiastes for a great example of this. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. Ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. You don't know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Here's my favorite one. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it shall lie. Wherever you go, there you are. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. 
As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning and at the evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that or whether both will do equally well. When we talk about the message in righteousness versus arguing something scientific, this is a very good passage to, to take a moment and consider. What this passage is doing is it's reminding us to get about the work that needs to be done here. Right? If you... If you try to read the wind, if you try to stare at the clouds and you forget to actually plant the seed, nothing's going to happen. Get about doing things. You're not quite sure how everything's going to turn out, but you do know if you put your nose to the grindstone and get to working, something's going to happen. Is that a fair message? Yeah. God's saying, you know, get off your bottom and start doing some work. And then it's also saying... In a very poetic and beautiful way, this Ecclesiastes is considered a book of wisdom. It's saying that there are mysteries of God. And for them, here are two of the mysteries. Where does the wind come from? Where does it go? We know that the mother's belly gets big, but we don't know quite sure what's happening inside of it when that baby's developing. And those are all well and good, but don't spend so much time thinking about the mystery that you forget to get about the work that needs to be done. Now, through the centuries, the different way the church has viewed these mysteries has had a lot to do with the persecution of people trying to figure them out. Where people said, I want to understand how this works. And the church says, you're not meant to understand that. And they say, but I think we can. And they say, but we don't think you should because you're going to start peeling back layers that are going to be questioning God. And so through the ages, many of the advancements that we take for granted today, that we rely on day in and day out, are the result of the bravery of people that said, I think your, and hear this, interpretation is a little bit off. Not I think the word of God is incorrect. I think that we need to shift the way we understand it a little bit better because I don't know this what God is trying to communicate. And we'll take this passage and, and, and give, give a very clear example. Do we have people that know where the wind comes from and where it blows? We have an entire channel devoted to it, and every news show you watch has about 10 minutes that give that very information. When we plan a church picnic... We look to see where the wind's coming from and where it's going to blow. We look to see if that wind's going to be blowing a lot of clouds and wet stuff our way. And that's convenience. But when we have things like tornadoes and hurricanes and floods, suddenly this knowledge of asking the question, where does the wind come from and where is it going? Well, there's meteorologists who are faithful Christians and they see their work not as trying to diminish God, but as appreciating God's creation enough to understand it in a way that says the merciful, compassionate, Christ-like thing to do is figure out how to save lives and prepare people when trouble's coming their way. Do we understand what's happening in the mother's belly when the baby's forming? Okay? I don't. I'm not a doctor, all right? But I know there's people out there that do, and that's why when, you know, our kids were in the womb, we went to, to, to the doctor. We went to the obstetrician to figure out what was going on and get some ideas about how to make everything go as healthy as possible. And, you know, um, is it all right if I tell them Dr. Tom? Okay. We even went, <laughs> we even went to a chiropractor at one point uh, because one of our kids hadn't flipped yet. And, and, and they were concerned that it wasn't going to happen. And it was like, what? Okay. It was tight before like the, the, the point of no return. And so Sarah went to a chiropractor and the chiropractor went like, quack, quack, boom. And 
You know? <laughs> and, and the baby went, <laughs> right? Well, I'm glad that they tried to figure out what's happening in the womb, right? Like, that's a good thing. And we have people that are doing amazing work and that's standing on the principles and the ideas that many people through history have had to say, maybe our interpretation here is a little bit off. And I think we can do better in terms of God's work in the world if we start to look into this stuff. I'm glad. I'm glad that whenever someone has epilepsy, we don't just look at them and say they need an exorcism. Because they're not possessed by a demon. They have a physical condition. Well, was that always seen that way? No. But at some point, someone said, I think there's something more to this picture. And I guarantee that person was called a heretic by somebody if they were in the church. Now we have life-saving medicine that's the result of looking into it. And again, Christ is all about compassion and help and love and grace and all of those things that come when people use this knowledge and understanding in a way that is healing and in a way that brings the light and compassion of Christ into the world. That's why what I was saying up here to the kids is, is very much, at least where my heart is at when we're talking about science in the conversation with faith. People are going to keep discovering things. People are going to keep peeling back the layers of how the world works and how the body works and how the mind works. What our prayer, what my prayer is, when they get this knowledge and when they invent this technology, how do we help them use it in a way that is a blessing and not a curse? How do we use the information and the technology in a way that illuminates Christ rather than denying him? The more we peel back and see how vast the universe is, well, let me, let me ask you, I know what I think about this. Does a bigger, more complex and meticulous universe make God smaller or bigger? Bigger. I love hearing about all the wild things they're figuring out because it's, it reminds me that my little pea brain, as far as I think I've got God figured out, is not even close. The magnificence and the awesomeness and the majesty of God is not revealed by, by keeping God tiny so that we can think we understand everything about creation and about the Creator. It's magnified the more we peel it back and say, wow, the more we figure out, the more we realize we don't know. There's never going to be a lack of a frontier of discovery. And every time that frontier pushes further, God gets bigger. That's a bad way to put it. It's not that God gets bigger. I just start to realize it more. God is bigger. But the conversation has to allow us to go there. We have to realize that some of this isn't so much something to be feared as it is to be embraced. To give you a, a really good example of this, we have this dude. I don't know that they even had the word dude in Hebrew. But his name's Daniel. And we have a scripture from the book of Daniel, chapter 1. And credit where credit is due. Uh, David Kinneman, who is the guy who literally wrote the book, giving some insights into this Barna research we've been using, is also a pastor's kid. And a wonderfully insightful Christian who is wonderfully versed in scripture. And so he brought this out. And I said, man, I can't come up with a better example. Then the king ordered Ash Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve 
in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. The cliff notes is that they were some really smart dudes. But the way that it is written is very telling. Because what it says is that God granted these three, four guys special aptitude for understanding. And when it talks about what they were learning from the Babylonians, this is like a full indoctrination of the culture of Babylon. Everything about it, including their scientific and medical advances. And it says that Daniel and these guys embraced this learning. God gave them the ability to do it so that when they stood before the king, they were shown to be ten times greater than all the other people that had come before the king and were raised with this stuff. They knew how to understand it. They knew how to apply it. And it put them in a place of influence with the king. And if we know the story of Daniel, that influence went a long way. We also see with Daniel that allowing himself to open up to great knowledge, to new knowledge, to new insights, did not diminish his faith. In fact, everything he did was an act of faith seeking to stay tight with God, holy before God. And when they said to him, we need you to go learn all of this stuff, he said, I'm very happy to do that. God has given me the ability to do it, to understand it, and to apply it. But when they said to him, you're not allowed to worship your God, that's where he drew the line. And he said, I don't care what you say is going to happen to me if I kneel before my God rather than to the king. It's happening anyway. And we have these amazing stories of Daniel, uh, of these three other friends of his who are more known by three other names. Anybody know them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Chucked in the fiery furnace. Nothing happened to him. Daniel, tossed in the lion's den, turned him into pets. The story of Daniel and the character of Daniel is a wonderful example of a man who is able to embrace learning and knowledge and not allow it to disrupt his faith. And his faith was strong enough that he was able to use his learning and knowledge to rise to a place of influence where God's will could be done. My hope is that there's always going to be tension between people of faith and people of science. It, it, it's just, that's just the way it is. But if our goal is to spread the light and love of Christ, we've got to pick and choose the battles that we fight in that arena. And whether God sees them as battles at all is an, another matter entirely. I want to use another illustration. And I hope this makes sense. Okay? This may make more sense than any of the other babble that I've just done for the past 20 minutes. Imagine a baker and a chemist. And it's Valentine's Day and the baker says, this cake is red because red is the color of passion and the color of love. 
And I want people, when they see this cake, to be inspired to passion and love and to think deeply about the people that they love in their lives on this wonderful holiday and it's all about love. That is why this cake is red. And the chemist comes over and says, I didn't why the cake's red. The cake's red because I created this neat little liquid here and when you drop it in the icing, it causes a molecular change that gives a pigmentation to that icing that absorbs every color of the light spectrum except for the color red, which it reflects back, and that is what we see. That is why the cake is red. Which one's right? Yeah. So what would you think if the two of them like spilled a big old Donnybrook fist fight out into the street because they were arguing over why the cake is red. Do you think they were in their right minds? No. Because the conversation should be this. The baker looks at the chemist and says, I just want to thank you for following your passion and your dream." and gain the kind of knowledge where you can take these things that I could not even begin to understand and put them in a bottle so that I can do better at the craft that God has inspired me to do. And the chemist should be looking at the baker. We've got a few of them in this congregation and say, I want to thank you for taking this tiniest of inventions and using it to inspire people to be their best selves, to bring out love and joy and grace and compassion in them by the creativity that you put into the work that God has called you to. Does that sound like a better conversation? I don't know how that's going to look for each of us individually in faith. But I hope, I hope the next time that any of us find ourselves convinced that we are pitted against an enemy in conversation, if I'm the baker, I hope that I look at that scientist with a grace that shows them Jesus in me. And I hope that every Christian person who pursues their science and their understanding looks to those other faithful Christians that inspire compassion and grace and love for an example of what to do with the knowledge they've accumulated. Or something like that. Let's bow our heads. Gracious God, we thank you that this universe will never be dull. We thank you for the mysteries that confuse us. We thank you for the spirit that inspires us. And we, we thank you for the knowledge and understanding that shows us the depth of your creation, how marvelous it is, and gives us new and exciting ways to care for it and to use it in a way that shines your grace into the world. Help us to come to a place of patience with one another, to a pace, place of compassion with one another, as we try to see how all of this understanding that seems to be uh, discovering things more and more rapidly than ever before presses up against our understanding of you. Help us to find those places to graciously bridge our faith and our understanding 